Yes, welcome back to the One and a Half White Guys podcast, or more unsolicited white guy opinions on movies for long. I'm Nathan, your half white guy. I'm Nick, your one white guy. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about comedy, movies, and how life gets worse for our main characters in the sequels. This one especially. Yeah, especially. This, this is a really frustrating movie. When this you, may, this you, is sad. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is so sad in this movie. You thought like his life was going to hell in the first movie. I wouldn't be I wouldn't have been surprised even as a kid if the movie just ended with Peter Parker just like writing like a suicide note. Oh my god. <laughs> because everything goes to hell. And per- lower in person for him in this Personal, movie. Per- you know, on a whole scale, you know, on a bigger like man, man versus, you know, exterior conflict, but also on a, on a, on a personal level here, he has just the worst time in this. The worst movie. luck. Yeah. So bad. Everything, like everything just beats this man down. We are doing Spider-Man two today. Now we did Spider-Man one last year. Um, mm-hmm. That came out in 2002. We were a little bit late to the party on that, so we did for a 20 year anniversary. For, we did episode. we we did the 21 year anniversary episode last year, but this <laughs> one, Spider Man Two, is now turning 20 this year. 2004 when it first came out, much like we talked about Shrek and Mean Girls, a few others. This is the 20th anniversary of Spider Man Two, the Tobey Maguire one. We got a chance to check this out in theaters because Madam Web very did recently so good in theaters that Sony was just like, we have the utmost confidence in the rest of our Sony Spider Man universe that we're just going to go ahead and re-release every Spider Man because movie. Madam Web was just so good. I would say it made at least over ninety dollars at the box office. The first Spider Man is beloved. And I Truly, think yeah. compared to the second one for years to come after they both came out, it, it was kind of like paled in comparison because people yeah. were critics and audiences were like, this is peak. Like, look at this. That first one. Yeah, it's fun. You know? Sure. But uh, a lot of us millennials now have more appreciation for that first one. Yeah. But the second one, it's still really highly regarded as just like not like one of the best superhero movies or one of the best action movies. It's just like one of. It's just one of the like the really best movies ever made. Arguably, <laughs> I would a say really one, well made, well told story. I think it's one of the best sequels ever made. Yes, to it to a story, it's really up there with like Aliens and Terminator Two, Godfather Two. All they those, should like, all top ones. be commended. Everybody who worked on this because they actually you can really tell they really set out to outdo everything they did in the first one. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with you. And so that's our review. Go watch it. Released in 2004, starring Ilya Baskin as Mr. Dikovich. What if the whole, like your Jurassic Park reference is like the characters of Jurassic Park arguing. It's yeah. all from the point of view of the dinosaurs. What if it's Spider-Man 2, but it's all from the point of view of Mr. Dikovich? He's like, he's like Peter's never here and he never has money. It's just called Rent. rent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's taken. I rent guess. minus the AIDS. <laughs> Diego Rivera as Doc Ock. That is correct. Uh, Diego really? Rivera. Yeah, Diego Rivera. Do you remember that um, Alfred Molina played Diego Rivera next to Selma Hayek in the uh, Frida Kahlo movie? Alfred Molina is British, born in uh, England, but he has a Spanish father and Italian mother. Oh, right. Immigrant. So, yeah, he has that. Uh, but so he played Diego Rivera in the in uh, Frida in Frida with uh, Selma Hayek as, as Frida Kahlo. That was the same year as this, right? I think it's either this year or one year it's like one year off if not mm. this same 2004 i can't remember offhand yeah well um i know we'll touch on him later but my god so well cast in yeah this. <laughs> and finally bruce campbell ash from evil dead coming back as the snooty usher to bring in everyone else obviously you have toby mcguire coming back as peter parker spider-man you have kirsten dunst returning as mary jane watson of course and tommy Wiseau himself coming back to play harry osborne a.k.a. James Franco, returning as Harry Osborn. Well, he returned because he had nothing left except <laughs> Spider-Man. Except Spider-Man. Pretty much everyone reprises he the role. He pays the bills around here, man. Mi- repri- reprises the role, including Rosemary Harris and even, uh, what's his Cliff fa- Robertson. Cliff Robertson comes back in a, in a flashback or like a ghost thing. I don't know what happens. There's a couple, mm-hmm. there's a couple ghosts in this movie. <laughs> J.K. Simmons comes back. J.K. Simmons. Uh, Ted Raimi comes back. Bill Nunn is back. Bill Nunn is back. They're all Elizabeth, returning. Elizabeth Banks. They're all Elizabeth Banks, yeah. They're all returning, and it, you know, it, it makes for a solid cast. Nick, would you like to lead us in with the IMDb summary for Spider-Man 2? It 
follows as Peter Parker is beset with troubles in his failing personal life as he battles a former brilliant scientist named Otto Octavius. Now here's here's to be honest with you the 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 Doc Ock stuff the Otto Octavius it pales in comparison to all of the personal drama. (laughs) This this is this is Peter trying to be like a you know an up and coming like 20 20 year old kid trying to deal with life. He's 20 in this. He's 20, yeah, yeah, 20 to 21. Do you mean the Doc Ock drama or the Doc Ock action? Like no, I, I would say do, fuck Doc Ock in this. I'm more <laughs> concerned if Peter Parker <laughs> is going to be able to afford his rent or not. I, I have to say this summary. If you don't know anything about Spider-Man, if you don't know who Peter Parker is, mm-hmm. this is probably pretty confusing. It's just like, why is this Peter Parker fella just got to fight a former brilliant scientist. Yeah. Like, fight how? Like, fist fight? <laughs> like, <laughs> he stole my girl. <laughs> it's such a it's such a great movie, and it's, uh, like, the next obvious step for a Spider-Man movie. Expanding the story, bringing it to new heights, mm-hmm. like, introducing new problems, new yes. issues, and uh, building on, like, character development. This, this follows the same archetype as most Spider-Man fans would claim a Spider-Man story needs to follow there needs to be some kind of element of sacrifice of personal life for the great you know this greater good of being spider-man we need to see our baby boy suffer that is it that is i was gonna say that is it like the (laughs) spider-man fandom comes down to one thing we need to see this character we all love so much go through hell and we need to see him just like have everything go wrong and ultimately still choose to be spider-man and without that Most Spider-Man fans hate things. That's why Miles Morales, people don't like specifically him. I have my own issues with those ideas, and I don't want to go too far into it. Uh, I tend to disagree with the fandom on a lot of that. But regardless, this is voyeuristic suffering the movie. (laughs) You want to see see this kid's life be hell? Oh, yeah, we We got that for you. We don't, though. We feel bad for him. I know. We really do. Well, no, we do. We want to see him suffer. I, I, I just completely disagree with you. I think without, without this, without the suffering, without the element of personal sacrifice and the true stakes of what's happening and what he's giving up, we don't like this movie. That's what it means to be Spider-Man. Though. Yep. And without it, this wouldn't be a po- as popular of a movie. So if you really want to watch a kid suffer for two plus hours, watch Spider-Man 2. That's the end of it. Or if you want safe Spider-Man where everything's all hunky-dory for him by the end of you can watch Homecoming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like the most the most he loses in that is his date to the Homecoming dance. <laughs> Good old Spider-Man. You know, Spider the biggest Spider-Man fan I know. Mm-hmm. When did you first see this and how? What was it like? Man, uh I'm I'm happy to uh, I, this is one of my favorite memories of growing up uh as a kid. I remember my dad taking me to this movie uh when it came out in 2004. Uh, it was actually a very turbulent time uh, in my personal life, in my family's personal life. We had uh, an illness with one of our family members. So it was a very turbulent time. I didn't really get to see much of my dad during that uh, time in the summer, uh, around that beginning of the year to, to summer. So going to see this movie with my dad uh, was super big. I remember going to the local theater and got in and I got to see Spider-Man 2. And there was that one scene that scared me. And we'll get to that later. But regardless of it, My dad remembers a story specifically about talking to me about whether we thought Doc Ock was a villain or a victim in the movie. Is he a victim of these, this AI intelligence and he's really trying to do a good thing and he just believes in it and it's being manipulated or is he actually, you know, a villain? He's doing a lot of really bad stuff. You know, is he a villain or victim? And my dad told me a story, which I forgot that I did. He goes, he said that uh, I said, but I really feel bad for, Peter Parker in this movie. And my dad was like, why? Because of, you know, all the fighting and like everything he's going through. It's like, no, because his bills are high. (laughs) (laughs) I I feel bad that Peter Parker can't pay his rent. And it's just like, you knew, you knew knew. back then. (laughs) I knew. And it was deep down. I mean, like this was, this was a movie that really locked me into like loving Spider-Man even more. I had grown up with the Spider-Man, the animated series cartoon, as I talked about on the Spider-Man one episode, I had seen Spider-Man 1. I had played the PS1 Spider-Man video game and also the PS2 Spider-1 game based on the movie. Yeah. I had just like absorbed so much Spider-Man media and now I'd seen this and this really locked me in uh, because I was around 10 at the time, 9 to 10. 
And this would have been like huge. And I yeah. remember loving this movie and having that discussion with my dad. And it was probably the first time my dad ever acknowledged. It. It's like, oh, yeah, he'll probably do something with like filmmaking and art in the future. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But that's probably the first time because I had this really long discussion about whether I thought, you know, Doc Ock was a villain or victim. But I, 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 I remember that. It's a very special time in my heart. I remember this story a lot, and it was, it's still something I hold dear. I mean, you, he's obviously a victim of his own circumstance, much like a lot of Spider-Man villains, unwilling. The lizard is the same way, right? After a while, he doesn't really want to be the lizard, but he has these powers that turn him into it. But the truth is, you know, he wants to do all these things, and, you know, he, he, he wants to pursue his own scientific endeavors and he believes in the good of humanity. But what are you sacrificing to do it? You're, ki you're hurting a lot of people. And in order to get to it, you almost killed an entire train full of people. He, he, they do write him really well in this. Sure. Enough. Like, yeah, sometimes it's just kind of like he's doing it just for the sake of like, oh, we got to drive this forward. He's, mm -hmm. he's crazy, you know. But they do hint at like his obsessiveness early mm -hmm. on in the movie. Like everything's set up perfectly and like is finished perfectly they even set up the hero villain dynamic fantastically yeah. because peter parker gets to meet him at the beginning of the movie he's not just a random villain of the week this guy is like kind of personal to him mm -hmm. in a way and they end up forming a bond at the beginning of the movie which makes it which makes it really interesting watching peter parker see this guy like end up what he becomes you know yeah. you have to like just save the city from him yeah. essentially and also try to pull him back from the brink yeah. Exactly, yeah. It, there's the there's the bigger dynamic, and again, this is a big good Spider-Man trope. There's the bigger dynamic of trying to save the city from the villain, but there's also the the more personal dynamic of trying to save the person that is the villain from themselves, mm -hmm. essentially like that. It's the same thing with like Green Goblin in the first movie, once he knew, but it was clear, you know, by the end of it, it wasn't going to happen. Oh, and he was far gone. He was a point. father dynamic, he was far gone. But even in comics and everything, you're trying to save this person and get them like cured and like pull them back from the villain powers they have to make them whole again give them a second chance yeah and so spider-man's just inherently good and they emphasize that in no way home what yeah, about well you said. when did you first see this even though you can't top that story go ahead um <laughs> i didn't see this in theaters moving on <laughs> but go ahead, continue continue i didn't get to see any of them in theaters that's you, why when they all got re-released just the uh, very recently last month that was mm. uh we went spider saw, mondays we went and saw all three of them like uh monday after the next it was fantastic i had never gotten to see any of those the toby mcguire ones the sam raimi ones i never got seen theaters but yeah. now i have and the, it was a blast like i'm so glad you and i went i'll post a picture of us going later but it, it was so cool seeing all three of them on the big screen yes even the third one mm -hmm. and the first time i saw this second one i went over to my friend jack's house jack if you're watching you might remember this and he's like because i don't know if i'd seen the first one yet i okay. don't think i had i think i knew what happened in it but mm -hmm. i hadn't watched it i think this one was actually my first spider-man movie i ever watched mm -hmm. i go over to his house he's got it he's like let's watch it and it was the same thing that happened to you i it stuck with me. I mm -hmm. thought it was really interesting, and I was really scared by this one scene. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. We just remembered we had these. Uh, I was like, I can't. I'm getting thirsty. And then Nick was like, yeah. And I go, didn't we get bugs made? <laughs> 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 All right. Anyway, now we're more branding. Whatever. You thought this didn't used to be a corporate podcast. Look at it now. I love how this movie... All immediately off the bat emphasizes Peter Parker. He's not. He's not doing, doing so well. <laughs> well. How many years has it been since the first movie? It seems like it's been like a year at most. You didn't you say two? It's a year or two. It seems like is is I, I forget in, in the movie they they date it and I think it's only it's been like a year or two. Okay. But uh, yeah, because doesn't Aunt May say like, "Hey, it's like the second year or first year anniversary of Uncle Ben." Yeah, Let's of go Uncle see Ben him. dying. Let's go yeah. see him. Yeah, second year. Yeah, I think so. Year okay. or two. So he's twenty. He's got to be like twenty at this. Twenty point. to twenty-one. He's he's getting there. And babyface Toby Maguire. He's got a little moped. He's a little moped. <laughs> a yeah, little, a little bike. Because being Spider-Man has become such a burden to him. He wants to do it. Mm -hmm. You know he. Wants to do it, he gets something out of doing it. He's great at doing it, mm -hmm. but it is making his personal life just go to hell. 
He's missing classes at college. He can't hold down a job. He can barely pay rent. Yeah. It's like, it's put like a really big strain on like all his like relationships and friendships. He doesn't have time for Mary Jane, even though he friend zoned her at the end of the first movie. He's got no time for anything, really. Nothing. Yeah. Kind of like being an adult. Yeah. It really emphasized that transition from like childhood to adulthood and recognizing responsibilities. And uh, I, I know you haven't played the Spider Man 2 game. That game does well at kind of the same thing as Spider-Man 2, the movie. And I feel like this movie and Spider-Man's life, especially when he's trying to do all this, comes down to one word, and it's a word we all need to keep in our own lives and, and use, balance. 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 Balance is that. Now, being Spider-Man's great and helping people's awesome, but if you do it too much, your own life suffers. But that also comes at the fact is the honest, hard truth of being a superhero you can't save everyone. Mm -mm. And just the fact that you are there doing your best is great. And it saves some, but you won't save everyone. But if you believe it's like, oh, if I just work harder, if I just work harder, if I just work harder. Mm -hmm. But it, you get nothing at the end of it a lot of times. If I, if I may reference a DC movie that mm -hmm. is like one of the most heart-wrenching moments in Christopher Reeve's Superman. Sure. Is, is Pa Kent dying of a simple heart attack? Yeah. And... At his funeral, Clark says, like, I have all of these abilities and I couldn't save them. Yeah. You can do anything. You can't do everything. There's limitations and you need to put your effort into what really matters. And that's that's really that's really what it comes down to. It's your choice. It, it It's always your choice. But sometimes look at us getting breachy on the Spider-Man podcast. <laughs> Spider -Man that's how good this movie that's is. That's how good. Nick, I want to let you know. Did you know the original title for Spider-Man 2? Oh, okay. I thought you were going to tell me. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I was waiting for you to ask. <laughs> it, the original title was The Amazing Spider-Man. So this is Spider-Man 1, and there was supposed to be Amazing Spider-Man, which they decided not to go with because they had an idea about some other British asshole taking the mantle up later in the future, which they would. Tom Holland. That, well, that <laughs> asshole, too. But the first one's Andrew, you know, Andrew Garfield being <laughs> know. the Amazing Spider-Man. But since they simply went with Spider-Man 2, which Sam Raimi, I'm assuming, is like, well, it works so well with Evil Dead. Let's just throw, slap a two on that bitch. <laughs> Spider-Man 2, Dead by Dawn. So Peter Parker is now a pizza delivery boy driving past. Well, no, but not for long. No, not long. <laughs> driving past a sign of Mary Jane, I think advertising, what, perfume? Yeah, she's yeah. kind of made it. Like kind of not really. and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of not really. She's an actress, but also a model. Kirsten Dunst coming out there, doing well, returning as her role. If we remember, we left her as a waitress at a moon pie diner all right enrique i get you <laughs> in in the first one and peter is given a task by what's his name uh, asif manvi asif the... manvi as the uh manager of joe's pizza interesting fact about joe's pizza as well uh the address for joe's pizza is actually the i think the address for dr strange in the comics oh nice <laughs> yeah in this movie it's the dr strange i think he's like i forget if it's like his house or his you know, uh, the Sanctum Santorum. Sanctum Sim Santorum or whatever it is. But he's given a job. Hey, you have to get this pizza. What? 25, like 20, 20, less than 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. And you have 10 minutes to do it because you're late here because I need to get this pizza. Because you're always late, minutes. man. Why are you always late? Why are man? you always late? Where have you been? That's these people constantly hassle him throughout the movie about this because he's just he's there was a kind of busy. There was a disturbance <laughs> and he totally fails at getting these pizzas to the place. He, yeah. he, he does cheat a little bit. He just like suits up as Spider-Man to like beat the traffic. And that's why the best part of the movie is just. A dude sees That's him it. run into the alley with all the pizzas and then just see Spider-Man just come swinging out of the alley with the pizzas. Hey, he stole that guy's pizzas. That was actually, uh, <laughs> I believe Stan. So, Nick, another interesting fact, that was actually Stan Lee's cameo. That was supposed to happen. They filmed yeah. it with him and they decided not to go with that. Uh, they gave him a different cameo instead. But Stanley was originally supposed to be like, hey, he stole that guy's pizza. Excelsior. <laughs> if, you then, ever, if, you ever said, played, if you ever played the Spider-Man 2 video game, you know the soundtrack for this. There's a level where you're running a Spider-Man with the pizza, and that's what you're playing. If you played Spider-Man 2, you know that. That's burned into your mind, the pizza time theme. Hell yeah. Oh, dude. <laughs> What's the one where it's like, 
if you miss a button, you go splat into the fire and the ladies that's like, I'm going to die. That's Spider-Man 3. We don't talk about <laughs> Spider-Man 3, the video game. I'm going to die. He uh, slipped. <laughs> <laughs> okay, being a superhero is hard. <laughs> and it's his birthday. He doesn't even realize it's his birthday. He goes home to see Aunt May, who's still living in the house. On, yeah. Where, where does she live? Uh, Peter Parker's from Queens. Queens? Yeah. And, you know, we get introduced to everybody. We introduced mm. everybody. Mary Jane is still happy to be his friend and whatnot. Really hopes she, he can come to her play because she's in a play. And Harry's there, too. James Franco returns as Harry. And he is just one track minded the whole movie. I would say he's two track minded here. He, he's definitely stepped into the role of taking over Oscorp. He's yeah. definitely stepped up and he's like trying to lead them in a new I gotta direction. I got to go. I got a board meeting. He's got a board meeting. He wants to, he's taking the reins of his father's company from the first movie and is trying to guide them in the right direction. That's his day job. His nighttime job is trying to capture and kill Spider-Man. He's trying to look for any information because he believes Spider-Man killed his father. The rest <laughs> of this movie is James Franco asking Tobey Maguire if he's taking pictures of his friend, the bug. Or slapping him. Or slapping him for it. <laughs> In front of crowds of He's people. He's not a very good friend. Hey, Harry, I think you have as much mental illness as your father did. <laughs> You're one lab accident away from being a supervillain already. <laughs> one movie later. <laughs> one movie later. <laughs> anyway. Well... And the really sad thing about Aunt May is uh, later in the movie, you realize how much she blames herself for Uncle Ben's death. Yeah. And Peter is racked with guilt because really deep down he knows like, dude, this is kind of my fault that mm -hmm. he died. And she's losing the house. She's, li yeah, she's things losing aren't the going, house. Things aren't going well for anybody. Really. House is getting foreclosed on. And, you know, it's one of those things where Peter finds after the party's gone and all the cakes packed up that there's some foreclosure bills on the house. She goes, what? Well, yeah, she's like asleep on the table. I'm just, I, I, the first time I saw that, I was like, did she die? Oh, God. <laughs> Rosemary Harris, no. Who is still alive, by the way, as of recording this. I don't want to date this just in case she does die before we release it. Yeah, but, yeah. But she is alive. We wish her many more years in comfort. Uh, Rosemary Harris, you were all of our first Aunt Mays. I like when she curses. She's like, oh, to hell with it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, to hell with it. It's perfect. Uh, but. You know, she gives Peter 20 bucks for his birthday and he tries to turn it down and give it back to her. And she's, like, you need this more than I do. Mm -hmm. You can take this money from me. You can. And honestly, when I was a kid, you know, seeing that, I go, man, I, I would absolutely be like, no, 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 I'll, I'll figure it out on my own. I'll figure it out on my own. But seeing it as like somebody that's, you know, been through their 20s and like now entering older, you know, my 30s and age, I'd be like, I'm actually with Aunt May 100%. Like if anybody's going to figure it out, she's got it. She's got a way to figure it out. She'll she she has more options with with being able to get you know some money for that. And I was like, Peter needs that money. He's a kid and he's an idiot. Thanks, Aunt May. Thanks, Aunt May. Goes right into the hands of Mr. Dickovich. <laughs> right when he gets back to his apartment, Mr. Dickovich, which is Peter's living in the city right now. Yes, in this rinky dink little SRO. Yeah, <laughs> he's living in a single room occupancy, and Mr. Dickovich is the landlord. And Nick, another interesting fact about Spider Man Two. Mr. Dickovich is actually a play on Steve Ditko, co-author of Spider-Man with Stan Lee. He was an illustrator who also worked with creating Spider-Man in the original comics. Uh, Amazing Fantasy number 15 was, I believe, the first appearance of Spider-Man, August 1962. Mr. Dickovich, he's like, what is he, like? Russian? <laughs> he's like East European, yeah. He's like European. He's a, he's just this big cartoon. He's a big Sam Raimi cartoon. And yeah. He, he just comes in and he's he's comic relief because he's always just giving Peter grief about wanting rent from him because yes. Peter, you know, he can't he's hold down a job. He's behind on know? his rent, yeah. Not on his rent and uh, it, it, he's become such a meme. <laughs> he really is. Because, you know, everybody is like wholeheartedly believes that the entire Spider-Man like trilogy revolves around him getting rent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Parker's life sucks basically, but he it, he does have something that he can prove himself to Dr. Connors in school with cuz he's taking Dr. Connors class. Dr. Connors you don't know, he's like the lizard but he's not in these. Yeah. Uh, he is planning on writing Peter is planning on writing a paper on like nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. I believe and he's going to write it on this brilliant physicist named dr otto octavius played by alfred molina and dr connor's just like he's a really good friend of mine you should uh 
interview him. You're late on your paper. If you fuck up this interview, oh, I'll know. Oh, I'll know. If I'm you write flunk- a bad paper. I'm flunking you. Yeah. And so he uses his connections to meet Dr. Octavius. From Harry. Because James Franco, uh, Harry Osborne, is supplying Dr. Octavius for his experiment, tritium, which is a real element. It is labeled as H-3, and it's like a radioactive hydrogen isotope. Yeah, but what's he trying to do with it? He, uh, he, wants- try, he wants to create limitless fusion. He wants to create fusion to give limitless energy. Basically, he wants to do what Nikola Tesla really wanted to do and supply power to pretty much everyone for like a very marginal cost of upkeep and safety. This yeah, but, is essentially what he's after. Yeah, but this thing that he can create with his machinery and the tritium, um, it basically creates a little sun? It It's a, it's a small mini scale sun nuclear reaction is yeah. what he's after it looks like a sun yeah it looks like the sun and he even says like it's the power of the sun in the palm of my hand which you could have just gotten with sunny d oh i want one yeah <laughs> sunny delight yeah <laughs> brought, this episode brought to you by <laughs> sunny d <laughs> the real power of the sun i love the writing in this scene because dr Octavius clearly is just like i got a lot of work to do man i don't really have a lot of time for to be you, talking like, with fans to be talking with fans <laughs> And Harry's just like, come on, man, do it for do it for me. I'm paying the bills. Mm-hmm. But then Peter like really proves himself to Doctor Octavius because Peter's well, Peter Parker's a genius. Yeah. He knows this shit. And Doctor Doc, Doc Octavius even has a line later and says, "Peter, what have we been talking about for the last hour and a half?" It's just like I thought you didn't have time for this kid. Now mm-hmm. you love him. Yeah, because he's straight up because they're they're bonding. They're getting to know each other and they're yeah. actually understanding like each other's brilliance and each other's like intelligence. And it's a great way to set up what unfortunately happens later. Yes. Yeah. And it's a good way to have Spider-Man be at the big turning event of what hap- what, how Dr. To, to what create, happens to Dr. Octavius. To create the villain. And also, I think it adds a different level when you're watching it. When you're watching it as a kid, you're like, oh, I'm so glad they're bonding. But really, it's reality. Peter's looking at something that he either can't have or needs to change to learn to have. You know what I mean? You mean like have a future to be like Dr. Octavius? Not even that, just a girlfriend, like a wife, uh, you know, a, like a family to to grow. He's got that home life. Okay, and, Dr. Octavius has a wife. Yeah, he's got, Dr. Octavius has the home life and he's doing his work and he's supported in it. Peter does not have that. And it's kind of like a stark look into what he could have. What he really does want. What too. he wants, but... This thing called Spider-Man keeps getting in the way. <laughs> but a little spider bit him one day a couple of years ago. And it just keeps getting in the way. So it's this constant reminder, damn, I can't have this. It, things do go to hell for Dr. Octavius, though, because he has a big demonstration with everybody there. Mm-hmm. Um, his wife is there, like a bunch of investors. Or people, investors like and members, reporters and all and kinds of stuff for Harry's Oscorp. there. Peter gets invited. Yeah. And he basically introduces his helpers the real villains of this fucking movie <laughs> yeah. the real fucking villains of what this did movie. you think okay you read comics before this movie yes you you knew of doc ock like yeah. what was your first impression of like how they were portrayed in this movie they do a good job at assigning personality to these four tentacle arms that he has to help him work with the fusion yeah they're these long like mechanical arms that he can like control uh via neural link yeah, and they attach to his back on like a big spinal thing, but they're these large, giant like tentacles, mm-hmm. and they are essentially there to help him control the machine yes. that he has built. And more importantly than that, they can think for themselves. And this is kind of an important point. If you're going to set up your villain as this kind of tragic person that's you know suffering and dealing with all of you know the consequences of their actions, but they're trying to do the right thing, but they're also being controlled. If these things are just extensions of him then he doesn't really become that sympathetic. He doesn't have that. Yeah. He, he's he, not sympathetic. Yeah. he He's just plain evil. If yeah. They're just doing everything he says. It, if essentially, we'll get to that later, but like, they're not. Mm-hmm. They, 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 they're unfortunate. They unfortunately, in layman's terms, they become a problem. Yeah. And these <laughs> things, I do want to say again, these things have personality. Like the one that is his like right arm is the one that's very like protective and maternal. It's the one that gives him drinks and hands him things. It's like always the right. His, it's always the form. right arm <laughs> that does it. But like the left bottom arm is the one with the fucking knife in it. 
that has the spike, the killing, the killing one. Yeah, they all have their own little personality with them. And this is actually an important point, too. They had puppeteers for each one of his arms. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when he is carrying the arms, when the arms, when he's carrying the arms, as you see him in the movie, and they're walking, you know, holding on his back, these are real puppets. These yeah. are animatronics, and they are being controlled by puppeteers. When he, they are carrying him, it's all CGI. So those are the two differences in the arms. And each of these puppeteers have a job, but the the one that had his right arm, essentially his right that's top on, arm, that's on this side. Yeah, of him? was a female puppeteer. Oh, as well. So that's why it has this maternal, nurturing kind of personality to it. So much thought and effort being put into these creatures, these these arms. Like they they really do feel like they're their own entity in this movie. And they're introduced, and he is connected to them via a neural link, so mm -hmm. he can basically tell them what to do instead of them telling him what to do because he has he admits to everybody they're AI. Yeah. I created AI. They're <laughs> smart, but he has this thing called the inhibitor chip, yeah. which allows you know, basically no thoughts from his arms to enter his actual brain, and only thoughts from his brain to go down his spinal cord and influence the arms. Which is some random sci-fi bullshit. <laughs> that, that is that is the most deus ex machina shit I have ever heard in one of these movies. Like, there's a lot of shit in Spider-Man and comic book movies, but he goes, ah, I know you're right, but I created this Inhibitor special chip. chip that won't let me get infected or get evil. Don't you see how I did that? Which is like if when I was a kid, when I would be like, when, you know, you and your friends would play like shit and be like, oh, he was shot by bullets. And then I go, but he was also shot by healing bullets. These heal the bullets of the original gun. This is a magic healing gun, which is <laughs> shit I made up. And it's like, ah, I have an inhibitor chip. <laughs> that has to be there, though, because otherwise. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying I'm not saying it doesn't fit into like the surface level sci fi of this movie. I mean, there's surface yeah. level sci fi and there's also surface level uh, ghosts in this. But we'll talk <laughs> about that in a second. My main point is that it is some just random basic level sci fi bullshit that they were like, well, let's make this up. But you're willing to just accept it because the rest of the movie is just so fucking good that you're just like, that makes sense. I'm all for this. No, let's it's go. fine to accept because it needs to be there because then there's your stakes there because mm -hmm. when that thing is gone, then he's fucked. Yeah. You know, basically. So Which that's why. Which happens almost immediately. Oh, dude, he turns this machine on in front of all these people. He's got the arms attached to him and then it starts getting bigger. And bigger. This, and bigger. this sun <laughs> goes well at first and starts just getting bigger and bigger. And he's trying to contain it. And it is radioactive and sucking everything and metal, yeah. everything metal into it Some, somewhere. Wouldn't that be crazy if this was R-rated? Some dude's pacemaker just gets falling oh, ripped out of him. Oh, my God. That would have been full Sam Raimi at that point, too. I know, yeah. but uh, Peter Parker's there. And he's just like, uh, yeah, my senses are going off right now. I we, need to, we need to shut this down. But first thing, Peter leaves, and Harry's like, Peter, and obviously he's like quickly changing in a bathroom <laughs> into Spider Man into his Spider Man suit. It, he he saves the day essentially, but unfortunately, Doctor Octavius's wife does not make it. She gets cut up just fucking gla by glass style. Like, uh, yeah, she's about to be impaled by like eighty seven pieces of glass and just bleed out. And Otto it's, gets to it's pl pretty bloodless though. Yeah, but Otto gets <laughs> to see this as he's trying to contain the explosion or the nuclear reaction that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But not before he straight up attacks Spider Man because Peter Parker shows up as Spider Man and uh, Octavius is like. What are you doing? He's just like, I got to stop this. I got to pull the plug. But he's like, no, it'll stabilize. And he like knocks him away with one yeah. of his arms. But essentially, Peter Parker does save the day. He ripped, he unplugs it. He unplugs, <laughs> he basically unplugs it. Yeah, that's the whole thing. But as Doc Ock turns to see his wife die, he also touches the growing ball. And that fries the inhibitor chip. It he goes, gets electrocuted like a motherfucker, yeah. dude. It goes all the way up his spine and fries the inhibitor chip. And he collapses to what has science done <laughs> screaming at the fucking heavens here's a bright idea maybe you should. <laughs> maybe no one should have been in this room it was crazy that you maybe we shouldn't have done this in your loft in the middle of the city it was crazy you tried this on like a second story floor on market street i do want to say that <laughs> uh -huh. we're next to a falafel joint <laughs> So Harry's pissed. He's ruined, essentially. Ruined. He, he invested a lot into this, and yeah. like, it's basically all gone south. Uh, yeah. Octo Octavius is out of commission with these arms stuck to him. Peter's he goes like, to the hospital. Peter's like, oh, crap, that just happened. 
hey, oh, I better go get back to my shitty personal life. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Nothing else to do. But uh, you know what? Ha- who has something to do? A nice group of surgeons. You know, just on their night shift in the hospital, they got like a new patient coming in and they're, you know, they're they're primed and ready for this. They were trained by the best and they know exactly what they need to do. This is a little unorthodox considering that this man has four, four mechanical, mechanical arms, arms coming out attached, of his back attached to him via spine. Yeah. But they're they're plan I don't think Davis is in the hospital. He's still unconscious. Like yeah. he hasn't woken up. The arms are just dormant. Yeah, and they also specifically say Hey, the time that he touched the the sun, the nuclear reaction behind him, and it fried the inhibitor chip, it also fused all of those needles that were in his back that attached to the spinal column to him. He is now fused to those arms. He can't get it off. He of can't. Them. You cannot get them off. At least the, the the conventional way of just like having the needles removed and taking it off. Do you know in that's that, what they were planning to do? Though. Do you know in that movie? Do you know in that uh, scene as well? Real needles were actually used to to show like the going into his skin. Into his skin, yeah. A few real needles. Oh my god! Like yeah. actually, Alfred yeah, Molina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, <sighs> ah, I know, right? Ow! Wow, he really committed to that, man. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, he was saying. I was reading an interview with him. This is an interesting fact, Nick. With this, I, I do want to say. Apparently, on this movie, and this talks about two actors. Alfred Molina was coaxed into stunts he didn't know he'd be doing, and then just all of a sudden the scene was rolling and he was doing it. And at the same time, do you know who refused to let a stunt double do their own to do their stunts for them? Who? Rosemary Harris. Oh, nice. <laughs> she stepped up and is like, "If Aunt May's getting thrown, I'm getting thrown." the The goal is to first, it seems like, cut the arms off and get the just just the spine part left. Yeah, because then it's a lot easier to deal with, which mm-hmm. actually seems like a very logical move here. Mm-hmm. This scene taught us kids that Sam Raimi not only gave us dreams of being Spider Man. Oh, he can give you nightmares, too. <laughs> he wanted to remind us as kids, I did Evil Dead. You know who I am, right? Don't ever forget who I am. Maybe these movies like were uh, kind of a gateway to becoming horror fans for a lot of it our generation. Might, it might be. But because is... it would coax us to like look into what else he did. Yes, but <laughs> I will say this. This arguably is one of Sam Raimi's best horror scenes. Because it is so out of nowhere, so well done, so tonally shifting of the movie that it, I don't know, you have horror scenes. So abrasively, inherently, unapologetically, unforgivingly, like, violent Mm. and chaotic. You (laughs) You have scenes in horror movies, right, of pure blood and chaos, and you can watch stuff like terrifier 2 and hostile and you for all that was like big freak out <laughs> terrifier, all, two. terrifier 2 like just horribly like stone cold stop you in your tracks type of bloody um horrific moments and i do not <laughs> feel it has as much of an impact as this particular scene and i know we're talking about it a lot but this scene arguably is one of sam raimi's best scenes he's ever done because of where it was the time it was made, what movie it's in, and the tonal shift it caused through the rest of the movie, especially to a bunch of young viewers like myself. And me. And, and, and Nick. <laughs> I left the room. I left the room every time this came on. It, it took me years to actually sit down and like watch this scene again. <laughs> but <laughs> basically, the surgeons plan to cut the arms off with buzz saws. Mm. And the arms wake up. The arms don't take too <laughs> kindly to that. <laughs> this is a massacre that happens because the guy is like, anyone here take shop class? Ho, 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 ho. And then he thinks he sees something move. It's one of the arms swinging back and forth as though it came to life, realized what was happening, and then pretended to play dead again. It's like the raptor in like Jurassic the, like Park the ra- 3. Like the raptor in Jurassic Park 3. And then the guy's like, okay, so he turns the bus saw back on. And then he sees, because they're all wearing goggles, he sees a reflection in one of the guy across from him with goggles, the arm behind him. Yeah. He turns around, and the arm home runs this <laughs> motherfucker across the room into a window. 
there is no music playing in the scene. It's dead quiet. It's de- it, no, no. Well, it's except for the ex- qu- except for the it's screams <laughs> of the surgeons scre- and the arms. These screams of panic and terror and confusion and just death <laughs> are visceral and they go right through you. It's like it, I I can only like I can only compare it to like when they're screaming for Josh in the yeah. ba- Blair Witch Project. You're yeah. just like you're just feeling everything, man. These surgeons get fucked up by these arms because all of them just come awake like they're like tentacles off of a kraken or something yeah. and they just start like grabbing people throwing people like slamming people into walls slamming people into the floor like one dude one of them picks a guy up who has a scalpel in his hand and just like electrocutes him he into shoves the him into the light <laughs> socket yeah and just gets ah! and one lady just like gets dragged across the floor like clawing the floor with her nails like screaming for her life Interesting. I have another oh fact about that God, scene. I have are... another fact about that scene. You know how they did that effect, though? Yeah. They could not figure out for a bit how to get the the fingernails pulling up the floor, you know, thing. Usually you see that in horror movies, especially with, like, wooden floors. It's the old, it's the dumb college girl that went out to, like, the cabin in the woods or something like that. Ah. And some hillbilly's, like, dragging her in to beat her to death with, like, an axe or something like that. I love Tucker and Dale versus yeah, yeah. Evil. <laughs> and she's pulling up the floorboards as she's going to screaming no. They couldn't figure out how to do it on the hospital floor. And apparently Sam was like, what if we just covered the whole thing in like candle wax and like layered it and like made it flat? They're like, oh, (laughs) so all of a sudden it just like makes sense where like her fingernails are pulling up the candle wax as she's dragged. This one doctor is so practical of an effect. I love it. And it's terrifying because like it's terrifying. She gets dragged into like this dark corner. You never see her again. As she's like, as her nails are just dragging this floor, like one dude just, get, like one of the arms just like grabs the dude by the head. It's like a face hugger just yeah. got on him. Like these things are laying waste to everybody in this room. Doc Ock, uh, uh, Doc Ock is asleep. He <laughs> is unconscious this whole time, and that's like this. That's kind of like the scariest shot of it when it just kind of like when it kind of when the camera kind of like dollies up to him. Yeah. You realize he has no idea this is happening right now. He's asleep. Yeah, he's completely unaware he's completely of his actions. Asleep fantastically gets the point across these things are very these things are dangerous these things are very (laughs) very much not to be fucked with these are very very strong very capable very smart and very quick arms when they decided to film this scene there's two types of again we talked about the two types of uh effects at work here practical and you know cgi Mm -hmm. and stuff there again is both in these scenes and they're yeah. cut interchangeably so well it's hard to tell which is which. I think as time has gone on, you can tell a little bit more. Oh no, because like the faraway shots when it's just, you know, the table's in the center and the arms are moving and like grabbing someone, grabbing yeah. someone. You just that's CG, you know. Some of it. They actually built really 13 foot tentacles for each of the arms to be used by a puppet master mm-hmm. to like grab. And basically when it has to do, I think. Arguably, when it has to do more refined movement that's not close in, CGI then, right? But when it's doing its basic lunge and stuff, all practical. No way. And like Sam was, Sam Raimi, I said, I was reading an interview with him that he was like super behind the production crew doing this because, you know, practical was how he had done Evil Dead. I don't know. He had like $9 <laughs> and an idea when he did it. I mean... If you ask any Evil Dead fan, they'll tell you how much exactly he had. They so For some reason, Evil Dead fans, hardcore Evil Dead fans, are the ones that know the most about their movie 100% through. They know, like, everything. Apparently, it was so expensive to construct these 13-foot arms and shit was in such short supply to create it because also the Iraq war is going on at the time. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Iraq war is going on at the time with, like, special materials and stuff like that. They had multiple levels of security to get access to the arms. They had like this; these things locked down to make sure nobody would steal anything. Because believe it or not, a couple Spider-Man suits got stolen from the first movie. Oh, wow. first Spider-Man movie, and it took a while to recover them. There's no blood in this scene. No blood. There's no on-screen death. Death. On mm-hmm. this scene, I, you can tell these people are getting like, oh no, they're dead. Smashed, they're 100 percent dead. Like smashed, impaled, like crushed, like uh, like thrown. Just, just a, you, you know, these people are dying horribly, but you just can't prove it. You can't, <laughs> but you can't see it, and that's what makes it even scarier. 
is it's because you don't see what these things are actually doing to these people. Yeah. Like the, it's edited perfectly. Like that last guy who gets the, you know, Ash's chainsaw. Yeah. <laughs> he tries like saw in one of the arms and all four of them just like look at him and just go like, oh, boom. <laughs> Dr. Octavius wakes up, immediately deduces what has happened. <laughs> He's and, very aware and something gives, went wrong. And gives a good old Darth Vader no. <laughs> well, after, no! He, after he flips a cab over trying to leave the hospital. No, he leaves and the arms are... And rips are, the door off the wall. But he starts to notice the arms are escorting him. Yes. They're, they're protecting him. He goes to a little hideout on, like, what, the Hudson or something? Yeah, that's a <laughs> custom-built set. Oh, right That's on. a custom-built set. Apparently, it took, like, a month to, a month or two to build that like that actual custom set to be used. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's also where the finale takes place. And that actually took 18 days to film. Wow. I was reading, yeah. So it's this like little rundown dock, shack, boatyard at something. Yeah, by the end of that movie, Spider-Man's had enough of his shit, by the way. He really like lays into him and like in that hideout at the end of <laughs> yeah, the movie. Yeah. <laughs> but he's there. <laughs> Doc Ock realizes I've lost everything. I've lost my research. That's failed. My wife is dead, and now I'm a fucking monster. <laughs> <laughs> but he's hearing something in his head. No, apparently the arms, they can talk to him now. Oh, yeah, they're, they're like, talking they're, to him. They're putting all their thoughts into his head. He can hear everything they're saying. You can't hear them, but he can. Alfred Molina is so good in these scenes yeah. where he's got to just basically talk to himself. Yes, he's and, acting and, to and acting opposite these puppets. Like, yeah like convincing him and like you know egging him on just like no we can do this and we can do this again and he essentially gets pushed to try again rebuild the yeah. machine yes but that takes money meanwhile peter parker is going to start suffering again in his life <laughs> after everything How so well he's going to go to mj's play and this is a big deal he loves mary jane still even though if he friends owned her at the beginning of the first the end sorry the end of the first movie he friends owned her he loves mary jane and he wants to be in her life he wants to be in her life so he decides to obviously go to her play he can barely afford little flowers he got them for her though he's going he's gonna be on time except that Something's getting robbed not too far away. No, there's like people like shooting at the cops in, yeah. a, in a driveaway car. Yeah, and he says, hey, I have to go save this. So he almost gets run over. He almost gets run over by them on the way to the play. And he goes, all right, I, I got to be Spider-Man. And he somehow successfully throws the guys out of the car, catches them in a web and drives the car to the play. If I may, this is actually kind of a. Uh, this actually kind of lends itself to why that hospital scene is so like is it just kind of hits us so hard. It's because every action scene we've seen is just like cool Spider-Man saving the day. You know, he's saving the day. It's all it's all stuff out of a comic. And then that scene happens and we're like, oh, yeah. Oh, my. Well, Spider-Man, oh Spider-Man's also God. super strong, but he's pulling his punches with these normal people. Well, he's not so, punching these normal people hard. I do want to touch on hard. That, well, yeah. Well, he's not <laughs> punching these normal people hard. It's just a normal knockout punch. He's pulling it. So he's. He's, you know, he's, he's holding back, but the arm scene is like, well, I'm not holding back on you. <laughs> yeah. Again, sets up that these things, oh, they're going to give him a run for his money. Like, yes. It, it, <laughs> yes. He has, he gets to the play too late, too late. He's too late. Doors are already shut. The importance of being earnest is started. They're in scene two, I think. Act two. Act two. Scene two. Act two. The soon night. <laughs> But before Bruce he, Campbell at the door tells him to fuck off. <laughs> well, before that, he tells him to straighten his tie, tie his shoe, get ready to go in. And he goes, wait, why are you here? <laughs> what do you can I help you? He's like, oh, I have a ticket to come late. You know, I have a ticket. Mary Jane Watson asked me to come, but not to come late. You're not getting in. So and that he Mary Jane reserved a, a seat, seat for him. him. And she looks through the audience and sees he's not there. And she's a little distracted. Peter's stuck outside, hanging out. No, he waits. He waits for her. Talk, talking. He's waiting for to meet her after, but he also sees the lady playing the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the theme, the theme. The uh, <laughs> she's like this Asian lady playing, strumming a single guitar. No, it's a violin. Violin <laughs> saying Spider Man, Spider Man, in in kind of some broken English a little bit yeah. in the accent. It's, it, it's, it's a, a little. Scene, it's a, a scene that hasn't really. Two thousand four. Well. Uh, do you know this? His did, reaction did is you the know, funniest part of it. Because he's like, he's like, huh? <laughs> well, she, I, I'm be honest, is like, somebody, somebody loves me. But he gets to see her leave the 
Uh, yeah, he wants to go stage. talk to her. He wants to apologize, but he sees her go up to another random guy. Another guy. My son, the astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> Who's actually J. 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 Jonah Jameson's son. That doesn't have anything to do with the story. He just yeah. happens to be. He just know, happens to be. He's J. Jonah. JJ Jr. John Jameson. Yeah. John Jameson. And uh, he is actually a villain, if you know. I think he's the. Doesn't he become Venom? No, no. No, that's Flash Thompson who becomes Agent Venom. John Jameson might have been Venom at one point, but you know, normally he's like the wolf man. He like transforms into a wolf, I think. Mm. Mary Jane's dating him. Yeah. Plants a big old kiss on him. Peter Parker's like, oh. And then here's Sirens. Friend zoned him. Yep. And then here's Sirens, and like he's got to bolt into an alley and be Spider Man. But guess what? His powers don't work right now. Oh yeah, he starts swinging, and all of a sudden the webs. Is it the webs don't work, or he can't climb the wall first? The webs don't work. The webs don't work, and he falls. He plummets, dude. He's wondering like what's wrong with him throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. It's a really fantastic plot point to bring into the movie uh, amongst the. Amongst the dilemma he has. Yes. You know, of what, of like, he clearly, it, it, as much as he is like, I gotta do this. If not for Uncle Ben, then who, you know? But eventually he's like, I can't, I don't want to fucking do this anymore, yeah. you know? Like, that's, fuck doing this, yes. you know? It, it's just like, is essentially, I'm sorry, that's kind of how I'd react. <laughs> well, I mean, you can look at it because, to be honest, and this will kind of spoil it, but Dr. Octavius even talks about it when they have the meeting. Yeah. Remember? He talks about, like, never keep love inside. Love is a very powerful emotion. Love is this. Love is that. It can, it can, destroy, it can destroy you. From inside. From inside. And you can kind of see why he might be having problems with his powers. But in a lot of ways, then the question is, what powers spider-man it's yeah. love love powers spider-man the re the, all of all of being spider-man spoilers <laughs> is well even still like spider-man is a, is a complete act of service it's an act of love to everyone it's the city it's an it's act of very 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 goodwill humility and like working for the betterment of everyone it's an act of love and care and selflessness and selflessness and if you don't have that everywhere in your life maybe you don't get that anymore mm -hmm. Peter Parker and Aunt May go to the bank because Aunt May is like behind on her like bills. I They're guess. trying to solve the whole mortgage situation and yeah, and yeah. whatnot. But like, coincidentally, coincidentally, Doc Ock is there, looking like the Unabomber, <laughs> trying to <laughs> rob the bank. All the arms are hidden under a trench coat because he needs money to rebuild the machine. Yeah, he needs. He's going to try again. Where does he? Who does he sell? Who does he give the money to? The, I'm the assuming the black market. Black market. <laughs> He's on the dark. He's on the dark. He's on the dark. He steals money bags. He's on the dark net, which is so comic book. I love it. He money rips. bags with the money logo on the on in front of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He rips the safe off the wall. Safe wall, just com door completely out of the yeah, wall. Yeah, and chucks it. And Spider Man's like, "Oh, well, how convenient." He dons his Spider Man suit, and he has this. Leaves really it. He leaves Aunt May. Aunt May. Yeah, that's the cool thing about Aunt May, though, is that she. You brought this up to me when we saw this in theaters. Is that by the end of the first know, movie, you have to know Aunt May straight up knows he's Spider. -Man. By the end of the first movie, she a hundred percent knows he's Spider Man. Because like a hundred percent. By the end of the first movie, she's like, "Why did Green Goblin target me?" <laughs> and then she's listening to Peter talk to Mary Jane about Spider Man, about what he thinks about uh, her. You and know, and she's that, like, and Peter's <laughs> answering it in the most. I, I, yeah, or something the, like that. The most awkward way possible about flirting with her. And Mary Jane's into it. And Mary Aunt May wakes up and like I was like, dude, she a hundred percent knows he's Spider-Man. Like, that's a hundred percent Spider-Man. <laughs> he's Spider-Man. Like, how else would the there's like there's too many things that add up. Finish it! Yeah, but he has to save Aunt May from Doc Ock because he Doc Ock is stealing money and Spider-Man's trying to stop him, but then he takes Aunt May hostage. This is a great fight. All the fights in this movie mm -hmm. hold up. And you can tell this is where you have to respect everybody who works in this movie. You, they are straight up 100% trying to outdo themselves from the mm. first movie because everyone on this movie is 100% professional working hard. Yeah. Cause in the first movie, when he's fighting Green Goblin, it's very, I'm sorry, it's very Power Rangers, like how they fight. Yeah. <laughs> Lower budget. And I, I do want to say this as well. Alfred Molina has gone on record and say the crew of Spider Man 2 is the hardest working, most dedicated crew I've ever worked with. 
Oh, no shit. He specifically said nothing else has ever topped how much people cared about their job, Mm -hmm. loved their job, and worked hard at their job. Every single department, he said, outdid themselves incredibly. And it shows. Uh, um, Especially the visual effects department. Of course. That's what it won the Oscar for. And you can tell. They up the ante on the visual effects. The visual effects, yeah. It's so believable watching him swing through the city in this. So much more believable because, like, they... They staged this. This fight starts in a bank and then just ends up on the side of a building, and it's it looks great. Yeah, to this day, looks still re- looks when really like, good. When they're free falling down the side of a building, like punching each other. Yeah, it's so it's fantastic. I love these fights, and they're on top of a train. Like the arms are just swinging after him. The arms are giving him a run for his money because they're well, not pulling not, the punches. Not, they're not in the train. This one, yeah, not yet. I'm talking about the train. Oh, okay. I'm okay. just mentioning the train, but yeah, he's starting to get an idea of like. Oh, these things are a problem. Yeah. Because one of them's trying to stab him. The other one's got Aunt May. <laughs> like, two of the other ones are, like, holding on to the building. <laughs> Aunt May has a superhero moment, though. She sees that Peter, Spider-Man's going to launch over to her building to save her. It's pretty sweet knowing that she knows it's Peter. Yeah. <laughs> and she sees that Daka, which she's okay with having a fight as long as it's all fair and square. <laughs> because she, but then she sees that behind Doc Ock, He's going to try to stab him. He's going to stab... <laughs> one of the arms extends a giant silver spike, which is a knife. What was that for on the machine? <laughs> what was that spike going to do? Stab in the ball, I guess. So it's like it's like RoboCop's fucking like, spike. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck is that for? <laughs> but she goes... She like, oh, shame on you. Shame on you. And she whacks him in the head with the uh, umbrella. That does more damage to him than Peter does punching him. And here's the thing about Peter Parker fighting Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2. Peter Parker is a superhuman. Yeah. He is extraordinarily strong. Okay. Spider-Man has been described, I've heard, as being statistically almost as strong as the Hulk. He is extremely strong. Yes. Like, this is the same strength he used to beat down the Green Goblin successfully, just like punch over and over again. Who was another extraordinarily strong superhuman? Dr. Octavius is not superhuman. He's just Peter, a, he's just a guy with arms. He's just a guy with very strong arms attached to him. Peter Parker punches him in the face multiple times <laughs> in this movie and does not kill him somehow. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about? He hits him so many times like he's actually like hitting him, you know? He's yeah. like he's got to deflect the arms, but it's him he's going for every time. Yo, you no, know? he doesn't punch the arms. He punches him square in the <laughs> face. <laughs> go to sleep. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. <laughs> It doesn't work, but I'm thinking, like, he's hitting him, but, like, Doc Ock is, like, not going down. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess he's pulling his punches, but at the same time, I'm just thinking about the end fight in Spider-Man 1 where he gets so pissed off at Green Goblin, he is just holding him against the wall, and he just keeps hitting him, like, bringing him back up, hitting him, bringing him back up, hitting him. I'm like, that man was superhuman. He kept knocking him down. Like... (laughs) This Doc man, Ock's just a guy. This this man, this man in an <laughs> octopus fetish is dead. <laughs> it's like when we did the first movie. It's like when he punches Flash across the hall. How's Flash? He's dead. He's dead. <laughs> he punched a hole through him. Dead middle of his chest, dude. Like stopped his heart. <laughs> Jesus, Parker, you are a freak. You're yeah. next, Blondie. <laughs> <laughs> Get over here, sugar. Ray. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but do you agree? No, that's like kind of like that's kind of one of the things in the movie you kind of have to get past. I'm assuming the only thing we can give is that the arms are like keep the right away, keep the right away, keep the right away. <laughs> if not, we all fall. <laughs> Just like keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. I love that one arm that like when they're free falling down the side of the building, that one arm is like trying to grab onto the building to <laughs> save them. <laughs> it's like oh shit, fuck, shit, fuck, fuck, shit. fuck. fuck. <laughs> It's a great fight. The visual effects, like, they top themselves. They get a little... They look at their best in this movie, I think. The th- yeah. In the third movie, sometimes they look fantastic. Sometimes they look, like, worse than the first movie. Yeah. We love this movie. You guys should absolutely I see, love this see this movie, movie too, and we'll talk yeah. about it more in the, in the rating. Uh, let's go ahead and move to the facts section. You ready? I am ready. The facts section is real facts about the movie. Only a couple. You know, we're doing our new thing that Nick has never seen. And he's going to read them live. For you, and again, these are real facts about Spider-Man Two, just with some other stuff included. Fact number one: Spider-Man Two was released on June thirtieth, two thousand four, to an eighty-eight million dollar opening weekend. It earned a total of three hundred seventy-three point five million while in theaters domestically, placing it at number thirty-nine on the all-time inflation-adjusted domestic box office list. 
Some of its competition in the summer and fall of 2004 included Dodgeball, a true underdog story starring the Zoolander himself, Ben Stiller, Napoleon Dynamite starring the first Latino president, <laughs> and finally Seed of Chucky starring trans horror icon Glenn slash Glenda. I don't know. I'm trying not to dead name them. Whatever that slashy puppet decided. We at the one and a half go one <laughs> one and a half white guys podcast support trans horror icons. Glenn and Glenda can be whatever they want as long as they carve up a bunch of people on screen for us, which they actually don't do that much in the first seat of Chucky. If you remember, <laughs> they're like, I don't know if I want to be a killer. And Chucky's like, what the fuck's wrong with you? He has no problem with his child being trans. He has a problem with his child not wanting to kill a bunch of people which is how parents should be disappointed at their kids. Not actions, not who they are. <laughs> or lack of action. <laughs> I love you for who you are, but you are a disappointment to me for everything you like. <laughs> Production budget for this movie, Spider-Man 2, $200 million. They, they threw money at this. They really today, wanted dude, today, to improve today, that's this. like an average blockbuster today. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they really threw money to make sure this worked. Because the first one killed they it. They killed so so much and they, when they were for, you know it's the first movie and yeah it's gonna do well but when it when they were like actually spider-man one's really fucking good we <laughs> we couldn't make a lot of money doing this. yeah so it's 200 million international numbers 41.2 million internationally total box office revenue while in 2004 795 million dollars for spider-man 2 for 2004 it falls to number two on highest grossing, can you guess what number one is? I know you know it. 2004. 2004. Shrek 2. Yep, Shrek 2. <laughs> yeah. Shrek 2 beats it out, but not by like a ton. Re-release numbers, at least what I got, and it doesn't seem accurate. $29,000. Does not seem accurate. I'll be honest with you. It doesn't seem accurate that it's only 29000 especially when I know Shrek 2's re-release got a million. Yeah. For 2024, this recently coming out for Spider Mondays. I know it made more money than that. It but did good. That's there, what I, it, the theater was pretty packed when we went to it. Yeah, and I, I was like, I know people are seeing this movie. It, it was a small theater, but like every time Maybe we went Maybe because it's a to, Monday? Yeah. That might do it. Like that might actually do it because Shrek 2 did a weekend, did a whole weekend, mm -hmm. like Friday through Sunday, like proper. What did The Mummy do? The Mummy was on like just two days only. Yeah, <laughs> randomly two days, <laughs> 1 p.m. on a Wednesday. Oh, yeah, that's Fuck, right. where yeah. was I supposed to see this shit, man? <laughs> Fact number two, Dashboard Confessional was approached to write a song for the end credits. They agreed, but only if they could have an advanced screening of the movie. The studio agreed. After watching the film, Chris Caraba, 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 I forget who's this, I forget how to say his last name. I don't listen to Dashboard Confessional. Go ahead. After watching the film, Chris Caraba, the lead singer, wrote Vindicated, saying, quote, I wrote that shit in like 10 minutes. Fuck you, Chad Kroger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he didn't actually say that. But but he, so they, this is true though. He wrote it in 10 minutes after seeing the movie. Oh shit. He was like, oh yeah. And like wrote, went into the other room. And I'm assuming the Sony executive was like bringing the movie with them. And like, all right, we'll, we'll talk to you later. Uh, can we get the, you know, let us know when you have the song. He's like, oh, I got it for you. Here you go. It's like written on a napkin. <laughs> He wrote Vindicated. Uh, Vindicated is the only song I know by Dashboard Confessional because it was in the movie and because I've been listening to it recently just to, to prep myself for this fact. Mm -hmm. But I will say this. I will let you know. On Spotify, I don't, I don't know how much it's sold on you know actual records and stuff like that. On Spotify right now, which we still promote because we're on there, uh, Chad Kroger's Hero. And Josie Scott. Josie Scott. 106 million plays. Yeah. Dashboard Confessionals Vindicated. 93 million. So fuck you, Dashboard Confessional. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, you can really see, because Dashboard Confessional, man, I was listening Look to at these numbers! <laughs> I'm clearly bad! <laughs> I... <laughs> I, got I, I do, I do, I do. So uh, I do want to say this too. Dashboard, it really, it really highlights the change, and I think that was going through uh, America at the time in youth because Dashboard Confessional is much more angsty and emo, like yeah. much more sad. It's much more sad boy music because, like, dude, Shrek Kroger is apparently the nicest fucking person, dude. He's, <laughs> I have heard nothing but like the nicest stories that he like is donates money to children's hospitals. 
is super personable with fans. Is like so one of the name. nicest fucking people to ever live. Well, it's because it, it's fun. It, it, that whole trend of hating on Nickelback, I think, has passed. Yeah, you know, it was just like that. That was like one of one of the internet's like yeah. you know finest moment, finer moments, and whatnot. Yeah. It's just like fuck Nickelback. It's just like. And Nickelback's all right, you know. Yeah, it's and not, that's it's not, the fact that his name is Chad. Yeah, you know that's yeah. the only. Uh, that's another thing where it's just like, oh, who was he married to? Avril Lavigne. Oh yeah, he's married to Avril Lavigne. Oh, he yes, was. He was. They were. We're on to the what a story mark. This is the most interesting fact I've found about the movie. Nick is going to read it for you and rate it between one to five marks. And in the vein of our hero Tommy Wiseau, <laughs> what a story mark. There are varying stories about Willem Dafoe's involvement in the sequel. The first that is Willem Dafoe. The first is that the first is that Willem Dafoe was not originally supposed to return for this movie, but walking back to his apartment one night, he saw the cast and crew filming nearby. He stopped in to say hello, and Sam Raimi decided to give him a cameo appearance. Dafoe tells a different story, saying he was in a car with Sam Raimi writing to the premiere of the first movie and pitched the idea of Norman Osborn returning as a ghost similar to Hamlet's father in the Shakespeare play. Raimi agreed, and then the topic wasn't brought up again until one week prior to the shooting date when Raimi called him back and said, hey, can you do this? <laughs> I, Nathan, mm -hmm. believe that the real story is that Defoe was not supposed to be in the movie, but he suddenly appeared on camera just to terrorize James Franco, who had an emotional breakdown, but Raimi liked it so much he kept it in the film anyway. <laughs> Avenge me! Avenge, no! <laughs> he, he, he was talking specifically to James Franco, being like, they took me out of the series. I'm out of the franchise. I just have to say, this man was so beloved and great as the Green Goblin that he straight up hijacked another Spider-Man He straight film. up hide up, hide, <laughs> caused problems in another Spider-Man's universe. Became the lead villain. <laughs> like, he hijacked a Tom Holland film. <laughs> And made it better <laughs> because he was there. The, the, like we owe a lot to Willem Dafoe. We do for, for we these do. super for for this superhero genre. He do really we, he brought a lot to he brought he, a lot of complexities to 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 a super villain. He's role. really the 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 model super villain. What a super villain should be. Yeah. He's both likable and also truly just crazy and you evil. Gotta stop, you got to stop him. <laughs> crazy and evil for the sake of being crazy and evil. Yes, yeah, the reason we're selling. That's the reason we're selling the company to Disney. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't do this to me. <laughs> oh, what I sacrificed. Uh, this is a great fact, and it's a funny joke. You get a four out of five. Four for out this. of five. I can't tell. I, I'm. I'm willing. I'm more inclined to believe Defoe's version of the story. But that, like one of the others is like, oh yeah, he was just walking by, and I was like, I think that's the story of how he got that other cameo. In the bonus features, but they swear no, no, no. He was not supposed to be in this movie at all. Yeah, but it, it this this movie does bring in, and this is the time I wanted to talk about this really quick. There's the element of the sci-fi with the inhibitor chip, and obviously the arms, and you know Peter Parker being you know a super villain, or sorry, the element of Peter Parker being a superhero with the sci-fi as well. But there's also the element of like the mystical and paranormal in this because is Harry actually seeing? Is he going crazy and he sees his father <laughs> or is that his father's actual ghost trying to lead Harry down the path he's going to go in Spider-Man 3? And yes, it's a callback to the first movie, right? Where Norman has that split personality with the Green Goblin, right? But Jekyll and Hyde. Harry is not like that at all yet. He hasn't <laughs> done the serum. He's not any. He, he's obsessive, but he's not crazy. So the question really is, has he not slept and has become so obsessive, he sees this thing as a, as a figment of his own imagination and happens to find the Green Goblin lair, or is that actually his father's ghost? <laughs> or Norman Osborn really did have suppressed uh, multiple personality disorder, yeah. and the serum brought it out, like, no, I, I, I agree. Brought it out completely. And it has been passed to Harry regardless. Somehow. Well, yeah, <laughs> genetically, you may say that. So, but which applies to the first part, right? Because which is, the serum in the first movie, it really does. It, it's kind of like a weird comparison. It's kind of like the mask. Yeah. When Jim Carrey puts it on, he becomes like this really perfect version of himself. Mm -hmm. Albeit being a cartoon. The serum makes Norman Osborn the perfect version of what he wants to be. Sure. 
but that comes with him kind of realizing like split personality and this version of me wants all this this version of me doesn't want this all this carnage and yeah. whatnot is that the serum or was that always there? Yeah. You know, we talked about this in the first episode for Spider-Man when we talked about like, it could be either, you know, obviously. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's something to that, but Harry hasn't done that serum yet in this movie. And so the question really is, what is he seeing? Speaking is there, <laughs> is there ghosts in this universe? Because he, <laughs> uh, Harry, Peter also sees uncle Ben. That's he has a conversation with him. And it's is yeah, you may say, hey, he's that's having a, a conversation. That's in his head, yeah. It could be. Could be. It could be. That's a that's a rip your heart out moment. Yeah, though. I know. It, yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> where he but, turns where he's just gotta turn I don't Uncle want Ben this down. Anymore. Now. Yeah, yeah, I, don't I want can't this. do this for you, Uncle so Ben. You're gonna man. let me die one more time, Peter. Huh? <laughs> like, what am I gaslight? Yeah, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Uncle Ben. <laughs> but see, that's the same thing. But he's also ha but he's having this full out conversation. Yeah, it might be happening in his own head. But is Harry's happening in his head? <laughs> or is it happening for real? Same question. Are there ghosts in the spider <laughs> in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man universe? Because he's a horror director? Could be. I don't it's, know. They're, well, there's aliens. There's definitely aliens. <laughs> so you you can ask yourself this question uh, as you watch these movies again and be like, are there ghosts in these movies? It could be. He said, I mean, nor I mean, uh Willem Dafoe said, hey, I want it to be like uh you I want it to be Hamlet. Hamlet's ghost. Hamlet's father's ghost, as he appears to him in Hamlet, just like Shakespeare. And that's a ghost for sure. You can argue the ghost bit easily because it, him, his conversation with his father leads to him finding his father's secret goblin. Yeah, there. he smashes the mirror and oh my God, what's all these bombs doing? Oh, it gives it a wall the whole time. Oh, oh my God, I could level a city block. Yeah. Right, right. Oh my God, I'm going to be on a watch list. Yes. If anyone <laughs> finds, I'm going to, I'm going to Guantanamo Bay if anyone finds this. It's post 9-11. I'm in a lot of fucking trouble if anyone finds this. <laughs> Damn right. In New York City. Oh no. This isn't oh, good. No. Yeah. I'm a CEO. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> Out of a hundred. How much did I give the original Spider-Man? Man, this is just as good, if not better. Uh, Spider-Man 2. <sighs> Listen, I love Spider-Verse more. I'm always going to give Spider-Verse more. Back. Live reaction right now, I'm thinking it's like a 94. I'm going to give this one a 94. Hey, yo, dude. Same. 94. Yeah. So that, that's a 94 for Spider-Man 2. I didn't even need to do the math there. It's one of the best superhero movies. It's probably the best, you know, arguably the best live action Spider-Man movie. It's it's just a good movie. It's a really good action movie too. Damn right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, highly recommend. Watch the first one first because what everything the first one sets up for this one makes the makes the punch all, all the more impactful of this one. So yeah. Uh, comfort superhero movie. Absolutely. We're gonna play something similar to games we played before. Spider-Man has been around a long time. There's a lot of really weird villains he's faced. So yes. again, welcome to a show called Spider-Man Villain or ChatGPT Bullshit. Okay. Essentially, this is how it goes. One of these is a real Spider-Man villain. One of these is one I had ChatGPT write for me. All right. So I'm going to give you one and two, and right. I'm going to let you guess who is what. Some rise of the machine. Yeah, let's see if you do it. Me. Okay. The first one. The Arachnicar. Yeah. A real villain from the 1970s in Spider-Man. He's a failed car thief that stumbled upon a gene splicing lab trying to figure out how to replicate Spider-Man and accidentally gets imbued with the powers of Spider-Man at a lesser level and uses cars to drive around the city and steal shit. <laughs> That's his whole story. All right. The other one I got for you. You're, you're gonna be like, what the fuck? The other one I got for you is also from The Amazing Spider Man. It's number 100. Actually, not number 100. Sorry. It's Amazing Spider Man in the number 100s. Matt. This guy's name is The Big Wheel. Yeah. That's his whole gimmick. He has a little motorized car that is just a giant wheel and he rides through and steals shit. 
<laughs> Spider-Man has to do. He rides through, smashes through the bank wall, just grabs shit and drives out. He's like a giant tricycle, except <laughs> it's one big reel. You know that shit in, spy, in uh, I hate to bring this movie up, Revenge of the Sith that General Grievous rides around on? Oh. <laughs> that one fucking thing, one giant wheel? That's what he's doing. So, those are the concepts. Which Spider-Man villain do you think is fake? I think the Arachnacar. Nick, you got it right today. It's because the, you described the wheel like so like intimately. Yeah. I was just like, he has to be the real one. <laughs> you know exactly who he is. <laughs> He's the big wheel. The thing is like the that. Big well, wheel. The, well, the thing with that, that's just so weird. It has to exist, right? It's like, yeah. like, you're like that's got to be a real guy. It, it's a, it's a, it's a big wheel. Nice. That's a, it's a giant <laughs> hamster wheel that he sits in and it goes. It's it, that's all I have. That's what he is. All right, Nick. Good job. One point for you today on Woo! that one. So you get in the club as well. I'm going to let you in for that one as well. Thank you so much for listening and watching to this episode of a One and a Half White Guys podcast or more unsolicited white guy opinions on movies for long. Be sure to rate us, follow us, and subscribe to us wherever you're listening to this podcast and where you get your podcast from. And don't forget to follow us on our Instagram at One and a Half White Guys podcast on TikTok at One and a Half White Guys and now on our YouTube. Hopefully where you're watching this, at One and a Half White Guys. And be sure to tell a friend to listen to the podcast where we say we're going to talk about a movie and we uh, kind of talk about the movie. I don't know if I'm supposed to be that podcaster recording that, that episode over and over. What do you think? Well, my friend. My friend doesn't know if he's supposed to be that podcaster. Maybe you're just not meant to be making these podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> all right everyone we'll he's see just like, you just <laughs> it's now just the one white guy podcast. Yeah, welcome back cut to you you're just raindrops keep, keep falling I, on my head what it, what it means is my life is much better without this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> anyway guys we'll see you the next part time where he fucking just the guy's getting beat up in the alley he's just he's like wouldn't be there's a cut of him like eating the hot dog yeah. as the guy's getting beat up god all right <laughs> see you guys see you help, next time help bye <laughs> he just walks away. <laughs>